Alrighty, so today um, we have the pleasure of having Dr. Julie Broadwell, formerly Dr. Julie Mook, um, here to speak to us. She is a breast surgeon who works with Dr. Sockrider here in private practice in Shreveport. Um, Julie's from Shreveport with the rest of her family, grew up here, went to med school here, residency here, then did her training, um, fellowship training in breast surgery at UT Southwestern. So any of y'all who've been on the service with me and done tumor board, so the, the surgery fellow resident gives the H&P spill and we're showing images. So when I did my fellowship in breast imaging, Julie was doing her fellowship. So she was staying over here, I was staying over there. So got to know her then and have been friends with her since. Um, so she's super involved, super busy in the community. Um, she works at a, the MLK clinic. Um, she is the president of the Coma Northwest Louisiana um, board of Directors. She's served on the Shreveport Medical um, Board. She's all kinds of busy and involved in everything. In 2013, she was named Young Professional of the Year in Shreveport Bossier. So, um, and she runs a busy practice with Dr. Sackrider. So, uh, just thank you, Julie, for coming and taking time out of your schedule today to talk to us. So, here you go. You can or cannot use that. It doesn't matter. Well, I don't why don't I just talk? Can y'all hear me fine? I'm happy to put it on if, if you can't hear me, but what do you think? Need it? Don't need it? Where? Can hear me. Okay. So, I'm a surgeon. And when Stacy asked me to come do this talk, I'm like, what in the world is a surgeon going to talk to a bunch of radiology residents about? And so what we decided to do is I have what I call my cancer talk that I give with my patients. And so I thought we would just try to really just to remind me what comes next so that I don't go off on too many tangents. Just talk about when a patient comes into my office, these are the things we go over with a cancer patient. These are the things that we have to consider. And we'll try and relay it back to radiology a little bit. Y'all know the radiology aspect of it, though. Y'all are learning that. That's the whole point of your residency. So I am certainly not going to speak to, the, to those things. I'm going to talk from my perspective, from a surgery perspective. So just talking about the incidence of breast cancer, we've all heard the statistics, one in eight women will get breast cancer in her lifetime. We count a lifetime to be 90 years of age. Okay, that's starting with a lifetime risk of 12.5%. Now different things go into that to increase that risk, to decrease that risk. Obviously if you live to 70, your risk isn't still 12% because you've lived 70 of the 90 years. And so that's a, that's, a rate, that's a number that varies throughout a woman's lifetime. But basically breast cancer is common. We see it a lot. People ask me a lot, oh my gosh, it's all over the news, we see it all the time, or aren't there so many more breast cancers now than there used to be? And the short answer to that is no, there aren't. We saw a big increase, well, first of all, most breast cancers are women 50 and older, but the ones we see in the news tend to be these 30-year-old women with the two little kids and, and all of this, but actually less than 5% of breast cancers are diagnosed in women less than 40. And then talking about the incidence of, of diagnoses, we saw a big increase in the 80s with the you know, increase in screening mammography and, and in the improvements in mammography. We saw a slight dip in the 2000s when we caught up to everybody who wasn't on hormones until they were 90. And then since 2007, it's been stable. And so breast cancer is still a disease of aging. The two biggest risk factors for getting breast cancer are still being a girl, and not dying young is what I tell my patients. You know, the older you are, the more likely you are to get it. So from a screening standpoint, we have the NCCN guidelines. We know that starting at age 40, screening mammography is important. We do it once a year, not once every two years and what all these other people are, you know, coming in from a financial standpoint of looking at it. And then assessing their risk is important too. And that's one of the big things I do in my practice. I see a lot of people that don't actually have any breast complaints, but Oh, my grandma had breast cancer when she was 70, and I'm, am I at increased risk? Do I need to get a mastectomy? What do I need to do? And so the Gill risk model is a good way of doing that. Um, it's, it's validated for women 35 and older, so if you have a 20-year-old, it doesn't really work for that. But that factors into the estrogen association uh, of, of a woman's lifetime, so how old she is when she started her period, when she had her first baby who, what first degree relatives she had that had breast cancer, and whether she's had a biopsy, and if so, was it anything atypical? Those are the big big things for Gale risk. There's other um, risk factor models, but basic risk, and so that's what it's speaking to here, the five-year risk, um, the Gale model gives you a five-year risk of breast cancer as well as a lifetime risk of breast cancer. 
Um, and so that, again, is that number that changes as they get older because age is part of the equation. Um, and so if you do see somebody with an increased risk, that's where we change the screening a little bit and we talk about, do we want to add an MRI? Do we not want to add an MRI? In my practice, if a woman is a known mutation carrier or a first degree relative of a known mutation carrier and has not been tested, or if by Yale risk model she has a risk of a lifetime risk of breast cancer of 20% or greater, she is screened in my clinic. I see her every six months, once with a mammogram, once with an MRI, and we do that on a yearly basis. Um, and so that's where the risk comes in. The person said grandma had breast cancer when they were 70, that's not really going to increase their risk very much. It really doesn't factor into a Yale risk model at all. And so that's the part where y'all are the experts on when do we tell people to do this, when that. So we'll, we'll move on. You have a woman, she gets a biopsy, but she gets a mammogram, it's abnormal, you bring her back, you do some more pictures, then you do an ultrasound, then you do an MRI, and then you do every imaging we can think of to do, and we decide, okay, we need to do a biopsy. So you do the biopsy, and you get results back. There are a lot of results that it's a what the heck do we do with these results. And so fibroepithelial lesions is a big one. We know fibroadenomas are fine. They're not going to turn to cancer. They're not going to cause a big problem. They're not going to replace the whole breast. But a phylloides, the way I describe a phylloides uh, tumor to a patient is it's the first cousin of the fibroadenoma. They're all under this big classification fibroepithelial lesion. And when you do a core biopsy, which we all should be doing, we should be taking patients to the operating room for diagnoses. If possible, we should be doing a core biopsy. So you do the core biopsy and you get fibroepithelial lesion back. Well, we can't rule out phylloides at that point, standpoint. A phylloides tumor tends to be more aggressive. It does have malignant potential. Some of them are actually malignant at the start. Those need to come out. So the first, you know, kind of suspicious lesion that we take out from a surgery standpoint is a fibroepithelial lesion or a known phylloides lesion. Um, and what we do, we do just a little excisional biopsy. I say little excisional biopsy because I'm a surgeon, right? Operating room, day surgery, small incision over the area of suspicion. Take just that little area out, not a lot of extra breast tissue involved. Give the pathologist more to look at. The pathologists tell me when we send them the core biopsies, which y'all have probably all seen core biopsy specimens, they tell me it's like sending them a jigsaw puzzle without the pieces put together. And they get an idea, yeah, okay, there's some purple, yeah, okay, it's some gold, okay, it's Tiger Stadium, maybe, maybe not. Um, but when we send them an excisional biopsy, we're sending them the whole solid piece of tissue. And so they really can give you much more detail exactly what is it. These others, papilloma, radial scar, flat epithelial atypia, and atypical ductal hyperplasia are all what we consider high-risk lesions. I stole this from my partner, don't think I'm clever. This is how I explain it to patients. You drive through a neighborhood, you've got bars on the windows. Are the bars the problem? No, the bars are not the problem. The bars are signifying there is something in this neighborhood that can be a problem. And these lesions are our bars on the window. There's different studies that show papilloma rate. When you excise papilloma rate, you can have up to 20% risk of malignancy associated with those uh, radial scars, similar numbers. Um, and so th those are numbers you don't want to miss that. You've got a sign on your biopsy. Maybe you just missed on the biopsy. Hey, I do biopsies too, and I, I, I certainly, little to the right, little to the left. Maybe you just didn't quite get down into the core of a four millimeter cancer, but you get to the atypical area next to Cancer growing up, we talk about, you know, how do we develop cancer? Y'all have certainly sat through all of the medical school classes I sat through. You know about two hit phenomena, you know about, you know, circulating tumor cells, you know, you, all, all this stuff is in your head. But we know it has to develop at some point. There's been a lot of news lately on we are operating too much on breast cancer. And yeah, we probably are, but we're just not sophisticated enough to know what is going to develop into an invasive cancer that threatens the patient's life versus what is going to stay at an atypical level. Flat epithelial atypia, we believe, progresses on to atypical ductal hyperplasia. The difference in atypical ductal hyperplasia and ductal carcinoma in situ is just a size criteria. If you have two millimeters of atypical ductal hyperplasia, it is ductal carcinoma in situ, which we count as breast cancer. And so we kind of think this is our, our model of how it develops. Does the immune system handle some of this? Absolutely. Have we done cadaver studies on people who have had DCIS in one area of the breast and found it in other areas of the breast that never caused a problem? Absolutely. So there's no question the body can handle some of this, but we are not sophisticated enough to know 
which one of these lesions is going to progress on to an invasive carcinoma that is going to metastasize and kill that person? We still recommend excising all of these lesions. Again, just a small area, you know, just a small area around it, not a huge piece of tissue, but enough to clear that area and know for sure there's nothing else going on. So that's all the man, these are funny, these are funny pathology diagnoses. After that comes DCIS. I put a mammogram picture in for y'all. Do you like it? <laughs> I had to Google it. So DCIS, calcification. That's probably one of the most common reasons we do stereotactic biopsies is they have increasing number of calcifications. The calcifications have changed. It's pleomorphic calcifications. I don't really know what any of that means. Um, I know this is a classic DCIS looking picture. You see it branching. You see it growing along the ducts. Because if you look at DCIS, so the pathology of DCIS, I wonder if I would wonder what this thing is. I'm scared to push too many buttons. Nope, that one did. <laughs> okay. So the top, the pathology slide, DCIS is, is carcinoma cells in situ. And so they're the ductal cells of the breast. And, and the cartoon illustration, I think, illustrates it better. And this is what I show my patients is this actual picture. You have the ductal cells lining the breast, and you have a normal rim of ductal cells. A cancer cell, we all know, is a cell dividing out of control. That is the basic definition of cancer, if you want to get it down to its very base. So what happens is one of those ductal cells becomes out of control, and it starts dividing. It divides within the duct, so those are cancer cells, because they're no longer in control of the body, or the body's no longer in control of them, and, they're, and they fill the duct with these cells. That's ductal carcinoma in situ. Remember, when it's less than two millimeters, it's atypical ductal hyperplasia. Same thing, looks the same. Then what happens, the progression from there is so they fill the duct, and then eventually one of those cells breaks out of the basement membrane. I don't use that word with patients. Breaks out of the basement membrane and breaks out into the surrounding breast tissue, and that's invasive carcinoma, okay? When we talk about stages of breast cancer, stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four, we consider ductal carcinoma in situ stage zero breast cancer. We treat it with all, almost all the same ways a, a breast can, an invasive breast cancer is treated. Um, and then the pathology just shows it's the, it's the purple cells on the inside of the duct that haven't broken out into the, the surrounding tissue. So, Ductal carcinoma in situ, invasive breast cancer, we have multiple modalities that we can treat those. I tell patients what we have is we have all these different ways to fight it. Some people we have to use all the ways to fight it. Other people we are a little, we don't, we don't have to use all of the modalities. Four different things we use, surgery, I tell them that's me. Chemotherapy and endocrine therapy is a medical oncologist area of expertise and radiation is obviously the radiation oncologist area of expertise. I'm typically the first person that sees a patient with a breast cancer diagnosis. Sometimes a radiologist has done the biopsy and has called them, told them it's breast cancer, but I'm usually the first person that has sat down with them and said, this is what it means, this is what it look at. So what's going through their head is, I have cancer, I'm gonna die. Well, fortunately with breast cancer, that's rarely true. We do a really good job of treating breast cancer. And part of the reason we do a really good job of treating it is we have so many different ways that we can treat it with. We can come at it from multiple angles. So what I'll tell patients is we're gonna cut it out, then we're gonna poison you, then we're gonna burn it, and then we're gonna starve it to death. And those are these modalities. <laughs> they seem to get that. So surgery is what I do. The OR, the people that run the board in the OR hate breast surgeons because we have lumpectomies, we have partial mastectomies, we have segmental mastectomies, we have simple mastectomies, we have total mastectomies, we have nipple sparing mastectomies, and we have excisional biopsies. What does all that mean? It means we're taking some breast tissue out. You know, are we taking part of it? Or are we taking all of it? Technically, an excisional biopsy, a partial mastectomy, a segmental mastectomy, and a lumpectomy are all physically the same thing. I do the exact same thing in the operating room for all of those. Lumpectomy is the word I use in clinic. Lumpectomy does not exist in the ICD-9 or the ICD-10 coding book. And so that's just a word that makes it a little easier to distinguish, are we talking about taking part of the breast or are we talking about taking all of the breast? And so depending on what we're looking at, depending on what we're taking out is kind of what we call it. If it's a fibroadenoma, if it's something that's clearly benign, if it's something we're not really worried about, we tend to call that an excisional biopsy because we don't have a cancer or an atypical diagnosis. 
Once you move on to one of those high-risk lesions we talked about, a cancer or a DCIS, we call it a partial mastectomy or segmental mastectomy. That just means lumpectomy. Um, simple mastectomy, total mastectomy, that's the same thing. You're just taking all of the breast tissue, okay? The breast, orders of the breast, clavicle, sternum, uh, latissimus dorsi, and rectus. So breast goes a long area. And so you're just taking all of that breast tissue. Do you really take all of the breast tissue? No. Is there still a chance of breast cancer after a mastectomy? Yes. I tell my patients, nothing we do other than putting them in a coffin at the Rosie Funeral Home is going to decrease their risk of that cancer coming back to zero. Our big goal is making that number of the cancer coming back as low as possible. When we look at partial mastectomy versus total mastectomy and we look at recurrence and survival, this is a big question patients ask me. Every single one of them asks, what would you do? And if it was your mama, what would she do? They never want to hear my mama's answer. But <laughs> my mom is, get rid of them both. No, I don't reconstruction and let's move on. They don't like that answer. But when you look at recurrence, when you look at survival, uh, partial mastectomy patients also do radiation and we'll get to that in a minute. But a partial mastectomy with radiation is absolutely equal in survival to a total mastectomy. You're going to hear a surgeon say this. More surgery is not better when it comes to breast cancer, okay? It, it doesn't change their survival rate. Where it does change is their local recurrence rate. There is a slightly higher risk of local recurrence if you leave a breast. Well, of course there is. There's still a breast there. Cancer in the breast has never killed anyone. It's cancer that goes to the lung. It's cancer that goes to the liver. It's cancer that goes to the brain. If it's still in the breast, that's not a problem. You just do a mastectomy at that point. And so we consider those equal surgeries. There's been some literature that the radiation doctors will tell you that, you know, radiation, I mean, it makes you prettier, it makes you happier, it makes you, you know, there, there's all kind of literature that they suggest that they actually benefit from getting more radiation. Maybe, maybe not, I don't know. <laughs> so that addresses the breast. That's kind of the first decision a breast cancer patient has to make. Do I want a partial mastectomy? Do I want a total mastectomy? No matter what they choose, they're going to get some type of lymph node sampling because surgery is really what stages the patient. Because most patients are going to, maybe not here, most, I did nine years here, I understand the patient population. Most patients in my private practice are getting their screening mam mammograms, at least occasionally, and they're coming in with a fairly early diagnosis of breast cancer. They're not coming in with a horribly locally advanced fungi mass with, you know, lymph nodes that you can look at across the room and know they're positive. They're coming in with a clinically negative axilla and a small, you know, breast cancer. And so they choose kind of what do they want from a breast standpoint. There's size criteria, there's cosmetic results, things like that. And those are things that we go over with the patients. Those are, you know, if they have a really small breast and a fairly small and a fairly large tumor, and I'm going to have to take out half of their breast, that's probably not going to be a great cosmetic result. I tell them my number one goal is to get rid of this cancer. Number one goal, make you cancer free. But a really close second goal is to have a really good cosmetic result. These are women that do great from a cancer standpoint. They're gonna live a really long time after this breast cancer diagnosis. And you don't want them a year down the road, five years down the road, 10 years down the road to look in the mirror and think, I have the worst surgeon in the whole world. I look awful. And they, you know, they're in the midst of a cancer. They're very emotional. They're in the midst of a, I'm gonna die, I'm gonna die, I'm gonna die, I'm gonna die. Once we get past the you're not going to die from this most likely, and we get to a what do you want? What is going to suit your lifestyle? Partial mastectomy is day surgery. They come in. It's a 30, 45 minute procedure. They go home the same day. They, I tell them they can go back operate on Tuesdays. I tell them they can go back to work the following Monday. Mastectomy, you know, they typically spend one night in the hospital. They have drains for a week or two. That can be a little more cumbersome, a little harder to get over. Partial mastectomy, still have to do screening, still have to do mammograms, possibly MRI, MRIs, things like that. Mastectomy, you don't. So there, there's different factors that they can decide on things from their personal lifestyle, from their what works for them. Because again, we talked about survival, they're equal. Lymph node, um, sentinel lymph node biopsy, we'll talk about that a little bit. That's for clinically negative axilla, meaning you don't feel any lymph nodes up in their armpit. Is that hard to tell? Absolutely. Y'all are probably the best ones to tell because you can stick a little ultrasound up in there and look. Oh my gosh, there's a four centimeter lymph node that we can't feel up there. Um, and, and that we, we use that with our with our judgment as well. Do we have something that maybe is a positive lymph node on imaging? Do we see something on PET scan? Things like that we use as well. But basically, you can do a sentinel lymph node if it's not a clinically positive axilla. 
axillary lymph node dissection. So signal lymph node, we're taking out a few lymph nodes. Axillary lymph node dissection, we're removing all of level one and level two lymph nodes. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Modified radical mastectomy. Long, long time ago. They did a radical mastectomy. It wasn't even, you can't even, I couldn't, when I was going through medical school and residency, I couldn't even find a textbook that still described it. A radical mastectomy included removing the pectoralis muscles, all of the level one, level two uh, axillary lymph nodes, as well as all of the breast. It was horribly disfiguring. disfiguring. It was, you know, a horrific surgery to undergo, all kinds of, you know, PT and, and, and motion nightmares for the patient afterwards and really didn't do any better than what we call a modified radical mastectomy. All a modified radical mastectomy means is we're doing the simple mastectomy or the total mastectomy, we're removing the breast, and we're doing the axillary lymph node dissection along with it, um, as opposed to a simple mastectomy with a sentinel lymph node biopsy. And so that, that's all that terminology really means. So partial mastectomy, so a patient comes in, she says, okay, I want the lumpectomy. I've, you know, for whatever reason, this this is my, I don't want to lose my breath. I've got small children at home. I need to be right back into things. I don't want a long, a long recovery period. I want to do the partial mastectomy. So the first thing is, how are you going to do the partial mastectomy? If it's a palpable mass, well, that's really easy. I can feel it. But I have to be able to feel it while they're asleep laying on the operating room table. Not a, can you put your finger on it again and show me? Um, so palpable is one way of localizing it. Wire and see ultrasound guidance in the operating room. Almost everywhere I work has, has an ultrasound or I have a portable one that I can bring my own. And you can use ultrasound to guide it. What I'll typically do is once the patient's asleep, I'll ultrasound them, I'll make a bunch of marks with the marker, and then I'll use the ultra, ultrasound throughout the case to confirm that what I'm taking out has the mass in the middle of it. Obviously it has to be visible on the ultrasound to be able to do an ultrasound guided lumpectomy. And then wire and seed look. And I'm going to speak a little bit to that because I know you all see the wire looks here, but I don't think you see the seed looks here. Basically, it's just a marker for the surgeon where the mass is. Wire looks, as you know, when you do the core biopsy, you leave a clip. And I'm just, this is my surgery PSA announcement. Please, every single time you do a biopsy, leave a clip. Because even if you don't think it's cancer, oh my gosh, it's going to be cancer. And then they're going to go through neoadjuvant chemotherapy, and then the whole thing's going to disappear, and you are going to force that patient to have a mastectomy because nobody can find where the cancer was. So every time you do a core needle biopsy, leave a clip. Okay, sorry. I had a really bad case recently from Monroe. It just, it was a nightmare. Um, so we leave, we've left the clip with the biopsy. This is obviously something that's not palpable, obviously something we can't see on ultrasound, and so we have to be able to find it in the operating room. Again, patient supine asleep, not easy to find. Go to mammography ahead of time. You all put a mammography. You find a little clip that we left that's nice and bright, and we can see it on mammography, and numb them up and put a wire in. The end of the wire is at the clip. The other end of the wire comes out of the breast. I dislike this procedure for a couple of reasons. Y'all are very, number one, it has to happen on the same day as surgery. And y'all know the OR schedule, you've all at least gone through a surgery rotation. The OR schedule is a nightmare no matter where you work. And getting things scheduled and getting the patient in the right spot and making them through day surgery and getting them to the OR, you add in a, oh, by the way, you've got to go to mammography, which in some places is in a totally different building, two miles down the road as it was in Dallas. I mean, that, that just adds logistical nightmares to it. So that's my number one problem with it. It's the same day. Number two, y'all are very limited how you can put the wire in. You have mammography paddles you have to deal with. It squishes this way or it squishes this way. And so you're very limited with where that wire can come out. My number one goal is getting rid of the cancer, but my very close number two goal is a good cosmetic result. If I can choose where I can make my incision, I can guarantee a better cosmetic result. If I've got a wire sticking out all the way over here, I have to be able to find that wire somewhere in the breast. Well, a lot of times it's hard to cut in a different part of the breast and pick up the wire without destroying a tremendous amount of breast tissue. So you have to follow the wire down, which means our incision has to go where y'all put the wire. And because you're limited for mammography, that is very rarely the best cosmetic location for, for an incision. So what I like are the seed localizations. Right now what we're doing is seeds. They're about the size of a grain, a grain of rice. That's what they look like, but they're metal. They're coated with an isotope. It's iodine-125. It's picked up on the same lymph node navigate, the same um, na navigator that we use in the operating room to pick up the lymph nodes, um, just switch to a different setting. And what I tell patients is it's kind of, I use it kind of like a metal detector. So it's put in the same way your wire's done. You load it in the spinal needle. Same, same exact process for you. In mammogram, localize the clip, numb the patient up, put the spinal needle in, and push the seat out. 
The seed's the size of a grain of rice, so it's all internal. Nothing has to stick out. Well, since nothing's sticking out, we're not worried about a patient dislodging it or something like that. It can be put in several days before the procedure, solving the logistic problem. The other problem it solves, it's inside the breast next to the clip. I have the navigator, which I tell patients, like a metal detector, it beeps louder when I get closer. And so I can use that once the patient's asleep to plan my approach and maybe come from an unusual direction or a different direction because I, kept, I know either number one, it's gonna allow me a better access to resect this area, or number two, it's gonna give them a better cosmetic result. An incision around the edge of the nipple is almost always well hidden. I mean, they, you just don't see them very much. And it's always great when we can come from, from that direction as opposed to making an incision you're gonna see in the side of the breast. It's just nice to be able to hide those. And so I prefer to see localized uh, partial mastectomies over the wire. Um, numerous studies done with Mayo. Mayo has done thousands and thousands and thousands of these showing the safety and all of that. And, and, and that, um, so it's well proven. Just this summer, the people that make the savvy, the partial balloon catheter, have come out with a new seed, so to speak. The big problem with seeds is nuclear medicine, which means you have to go through 17 different committees in the hospital to get it approved because of some safety factors because of nuclear medicine. The savvy people have come up with the new seed. It's basically the same idea, except they own the machine and they own the whatever they coat it with that is only picked up by their, their machine but it's not nuclear medicine. There's no hazard to it um, like with, with any kind of nuclear medicine there is. And so from a safety standpoint, from a, you know, you don't have to, right now the seeds I take out in the operating rooms that I know for certain it was removed and disposed of properly. I'm not exposing the whole pathology department to, to radiation. Um, this I wouldn't have to do that. And so it, it looks very promising. So that's something new that's coming up. Big thing with partial mastectomy is margins. Margin status has been talked about since before I was born. How much margin is a good enough margin? That's very different depending on what cancer you're talking about. Obviously, if the cancer touches the edge of the resection, you cannot prove that there is no more cancer in that patient. Colon cancer patients, they need like, you know, five feet of a margin on each side. Breast cancer, we used to do what's called a two millimeter margin. Um, that was just a general consensus. Did any actual study say that? No, not really. It was just a general consensus. Two millimeters was good enough. Just recently, the ASTRA, the Radiation Oncology, and SSO, the Surgical Oncology Guidelines, changed in February of 2015. They did a multiple, um, multiple study retrospective review, um, including a lot of uh, uh, anatomy um, studies and, and lots of different studies, looking at, okay, what margins really matter? And the statement from radiation oncology as well as sur surgical oncology is that it just has to be no ink on tumor. It can be 0 0.1 millimeters from the anterior margin and that is considered okay. So that's kind of what we're going with now, so we'll, we'll see how that goes. Why this is important is re-excision rates. I can see and feel a big, bad, nasty cancer. It's hard, it's white, it's nasty, you feel it, it's obvious. DCIS, also we consider this cancer, I can't feel. It's inside of the duct, it's a microscopic diagnosis. So nationally the number is 25% of the time, depending on how much breast surgery someone do, that number could be a lot higher, a lot lower, but nationally the number is 25% of the time, the cancer cells are gonna go all the way to the margin and the patient is gonna have to go back for a second surgery and have a re-incision. Now we as surgeons have tried lots of different things to decrease that, nothing really does. We've tried frozen sections in the operating room, we've tried shaved, uh, shaved cavity margins where you take your resection out and then you take an extra piece along each side. That probably helps a little bit, but you're really just taking more tissue out. So just take a bigger resection. Well, bigger resection leads back to the poor cosmetic results. And so it's a kind of a tightrope walk. Um, so the no, ink, no tumor on ink helps. All these people that had a one millimeter margin now no longer have to go back for a re-excision. With partial mastectomy, like I said, you have to do radiation um, for it to be considered equal to a total mastectomy. Now there's some, you know, if they're 90, some of the studies say over 70 people don't need radiation. I can guarantee you if I send a 71 year old to the radiation oncologist, they are absolutely gonna get radiation. However, it's my experience, if I send anyone to a radiation oncologist, they are absolutely <laughs> gonna get radiation, so I don't know about that one. Total mastectomy, total mastectomy, um, so lots of other words associated with that. Again, remember that's removing all of the breast tissue. That can be done by itself traditionally, what y'all probably see up here most of the time with the big incision that goes all the way across the breast. 
It can be done skin sparing. What that means is you um, typically take the nipple areola or complex and through a much smaller inc incision, still take the, the breast tissue but leave a pocket for reconstruction. That's what that's done for. Nipple sparing has also been proven to be safe. You don't want a tumor that's near the nipple. Um, and you need a patient that cosmetically has nipples in the right spot and a fairly small breast. So in Louisiana, we don't see many of these. I do maybe, I don't know, two or three a year, not that often. Um, but uh, with reconstruction, they're gonna take breasts and reconstruct them up to a 20-year-old level breast. And most of these women are 56-year-old women and that's not where their nipples are. And so most, most of the time, it's a cosmetic reason that keeps us from doing a nipple sparing mastectomy, not an oncologic reason. And then immediate reconstruction. So the way I walk a patient through this, so they've decided, okay, I don't want a partial mastectomy. I'll get rid of these things. I don't want to ever have to think about this again. Don't take just one, take both of them. And that's fine. And I do that at least once a week. Um, we address the take both of them. We I want to make sure that they understand what they're asking me. And so I want them to understand that the risk of a contralateral breast cancer is about 1% per year. In a 30 year old, that risk can add up pretty great. In a 60 year old, it doesn't add up quite as much. And so they're not getting as much medical benefit from that prophylactic mastectomy on the other side. The big reasons to do bilateral mastectomy, absolute number one, genetic mutation. If you have a genetic mutation, absolutely I wholeheartedly recommend it. Um, number two, uh, peace of mind. I do a whole lot of peace of mind surgery um, with that. Um, and it's a, I can't think about this, I can't think about this, I don't want to have to get those mammograms, I don't want to ever have to think about this again. Does that decrease the risk of cancer? Yes, slightly. Is it really going to make a difference in their prognosis? No, probably not if they don't have a genetic mutation. But it gives them that peace of mind. And then the big number three is cosmetic results. It is very difficult to reconstruct something artificial to match something natural. And so from a cosmetic standpoint, um, it, it can be beneficial to go ahead and do bilateral mastectomies. Immediate reconstruction, the way it typically works, I come in, I work with several different plastic surgeons in town. The way we choose our plastic surgeon is who takes your insurance. Some plastic surgeons take insurance, some plastic surgeons don't. Some of them have a short list, some of them will have a long list. So that's how we choose. And we do a mastectomy however we're gonna do it. We've done them through reduction patterns. So it's a wise pattern incision where you take the nipple and you take kind of an inverted triangle of the inferior tissue underneath so that when you bring them back together, it kind of lifts everything, removes a lot of redundant skin. We do that a lot here in Louisiana because we have a lot of very large breasts that we're removing and you just don't need that much skin. That allows you to re uh, reduce the skin. So I do that part, remove the breast tissue. Then a plastic surgeon comes in, they lift up the pectoralis muscle and they slide a tissue expander underneath it. The way I explain tissue expanders is they're like flat water balloons. We put them up under the pectoralis muscle because if you just put an implant up under the skin, there's nothing to hold it and it'll eventually end up down here. Nobody wants the breasts around the belly button. So tissue expanders up under the skin, we in inflate them with some saline. They go back and they see the plastic surgeon every week, every two weeks. It, it, that schedule depends on them, depends on the plastic surgeons. And the best um, way I can explain what, what this is like for patients, how many of y'all wore braces? Did y'all have braces growing up? Most of us, most people have braces. Going in and getting your braces tightened, you were a little bit miserable for a day or two, certainly weren't gonna eat any apples or anything you had to chew. It's the same thing. They go into the plastic surgeon, they get injected with saline. So it's filling that balloon and it's stretching out that pectoralis muscle, making us a pocket so that we have room to put an implant. As they're filling it, they're keeping track of how much saline they're putting in. Once they get to a, yeah, I look good standpoint, and it's really a patient's choice. Where are they comfortable? What size breast do they wanna be? Uh, that's when they know, okay, we've put 367 cc's of saline to this. This is the size implant we need to do. They go back to the operating room, and this is anywhere from two to three months later to a year later, depending on what other kind of cancer treatment that patient is needing to go through. Go back to the operating room with just the plastic surgeon. I'm not involved this time. And they go through the same incision, remove those tissue expansers, and put the final implant in. The last step of immediate reconstruction is making a new nipple. Most of these, we have taken their nipple. The people that we do leave the nipple, just as a side note, they can't feel the nipple. The nipple no longer works like a nipple. It just looks like a nipple um, and 10% of those don't have enough blood supply in the crust and so nipple sparing is not as great as some people make it out to be. Make a new nipple the way they typically do it is they take some of the scar and they just 
take a long strip of skin and they wrap it around each other and that's the projection portion of the nipple and then they tattoo the areola back on. All of y'all look on YouTube late, later and look up Vinny the Tattoo Artist. Vinny does 3D tattoos. I have one patient who has gone to see him because he has over a year long waiting list. So only one has actually, you know, actually waited that long and done it. It is amazing what he can do with a 3D tattoo. And so he does 3D, um, 3D nipple tattoos. And so that, that is a possibility as well. I really wish some tattoo artists here in Treeport would get into that, but I haven't talked to any of them in the <laughs> Y'all can stop me if this is boring, you wanna talk about something else, we questions, whatever. I mean, like I said, this is how I talk to patients, but I'm kinda of used to them interrupting me every 30 seconds. So, so <laughs> stop if I'm perfect. going off on anything. Okay, so no one's no biopsy. Clinically negative axilla, you're not suspecting cancer in the axilla. Again, back to the nuclear medicine, they get injected by nuclear medicine either the morning of surgery or the day before surgery. A lot of that is hospital dependent. Um, at one hospital in town, it is too inefficient for me to do it the same day, so they all go the day before. The other hospital in town, they come to day surgery and inject them right there, and they don't have to go through a different department, so those people get it done the same day. They just do the dosing, dosing dosing of it differently so that we so it's still there. They inject, it's four injections around the nipple into the breast and it hurts like a son of a gun. And so I can warn all the patients, this is gonna be the worst part of your experience because they're awake. We rarely do this in the operating room or in the holding area because we um, have to have certain licenses and blah, 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 and it has to be this person and you have to go through 17 committees to get approved to do that. So it gets done in day surgery while the patient is still awake. It hurts. We give them a lidocaine patch to put on their breast to help numb their skin. Studies have shown that doesn't help, but it sure does help them mentally, so we still do it. They inject the technetium. It drains from the breast up under the axilla. Multiple studies have been done to show it always, almost always drains the same way every time. Every now and then it goes to an internal mammary node, and that's just painful for everyone involved. Uh, but most of the time it goes to the axilla. In the operating room, some surgeons will use um, isosulfan blue or methylene blue to give a second identification method. When you use the two together, you are considered 8% more accurate than using one or the other alone. Um, that is injected right before surgery, and then you need to wait at least five minutes for it to drain. And so then, same little machine that you've used to find the C, just switch to the Technetium 99 um, marker. And again, like a, like a metal detector, you put it over there, it's going to beep louder when you get closer to it and make an incision in the lower axillary hairline. Or if you're doing a mastectomy and you've got the breast wide open, you don't have to make a second incision. You can just go through the incision you already have. And you use that machine to help find the lymph node. If you've injected blue dye, you can also trace the, the blue lymphatics. The lymph node itself will be blue. And when you put the little machine on it, it'll beep like crazy. And so that gives you good confirmation. You're removing the first one, two, three, this week it was six on one of my patients, lymph nodes that are draining from the breast. If there's no cancer in the first lymph node, there's not gonna be any cancer downstream. And so there is an error rate, error rate's about 5% with this, but it's, it's pretty good and it saves the patient an axillary lymph node dissection. If being done with a total mastectomy, uh, we send it for frozen pathology, they look at it, Frozen pathology is a quick yes or no. It is not by any means the best way to look at something from a, patho from a pathology standpoint. It will pick up a lymph node replaced by a tumor. It will not pick up a little two millimeter deposit of cancer. And so after frozen section, it's also sent for permanent pathology where they can do all of their immunohistochemical staining and all of their pick up three isolated tumor cells and, and be as detailed as we need them to be. If the frozen section comes back positive while the patient is still asleep, we go ahead and do what's called a completion axillary lymph node dissection where we remove the rest of the lymph nodes right under the arm. How many lymph nodes am I going to remove? I get asked that all the time. I don't know. I'm going to take the fat pad. There's great anatomic markers. You've got the axillary vein. You've got the thoracodorsal neurovascular bundle. You've got the long thoracic nerve and you've got the latissimus muscle. And you take the fat in the middle of there. People with more fat tend to have more lymph nodes. People with less fat tend to have less lymph nodes just because there's less tissue there. So I know frozen section if it's a partial mastectomy. We only do frozen sections with total mastectomies because it doesn't make a difference if that frozen section is positive. This is where we're gonna get slightly academic. I apologize, I don't like to do this. Big study came out my fellowship year and um, actually my head, um, the person that was in charge of my fellowship was one of the authors on it. So 
we, we got buried into it, called Z11. Z11 was a study where they looked at women who had small breast cancers, T1, T2 breast cancer, so less than five centimeters of cancer in the breast, and had a positive lymph node on sentinel lymph node biopsy. Those women were randomized to the either just radiation was done or randomized to axillary lymph node dissection and then radiation. Okay, so those were the two arms of the study. Um, it was over 400 women in each arm, and we'll get to one of the, the negatives of the study. It was a big study, okay, Lo lots of women. Um, randomized to each, each of the arms, when you look at the um, makeup of the patients, the T1s versus the T2s and all that, very equal groups in the two arms. Um, and so half of them got an actually lymph node dissection surgically, and then all of them just got radiation afterwards. When you look at the curves of how they did it, they are almost equal. So survival was almost exactly the same. It's very difficult to show a difference in survival with breast cancer. Most people survive. And so you have to have a huge cohort of people to show a difference in survival. But also disease-free survival was, was the same. And so what we concluded from this was that in a patient with a T1, T2 sized breast cancer lesion who had a positive lymph node who was undergoing radiation, so they have to meet all those criteria, small breast cancer, undergoing radiation, and it was actually only one or two lymph nodes that were positive. They were a very small number that had three positives. So one or two lymph nodes positive, and that they were doing radiation. You can avoid the axillary lymph node dissection in those patients. I practice by that. Most of the leaders of breast surgery practice by that. There are some negatives, and if Dr. Ben Lee were still here, this is what he would argue. The study was not powered. The study needed, I think, 1,200 or 1,500 people to be appropriately powered. It had 900. Okay, so we didn't we didn't quite reach the power we wanted to reach. Most of the patients had ER positive tumors, which tend to recur later in life, and the median follow-up was 6.3 um, years. So those are kind of the negatives and what the naysayers say. Well, how can you really go by this? There's some old studies from 30 years ago before we did a lot of radiation that mimic these results as well and so that's why most of us have adopted that this is still okay confusing as mud i don't explain all that to patients <laughs> okay so actually lymph node dissection when do we do that up front locally advanced cancer you have a positive feeling axilla or you've had something that you saw on um, ultrasound or um, mammography that was biopsied and proven to be positive to begin with or sentinel lymph node is positive on frozen pathology. That's when we go in and take out more of the lymph nodes. Why don't we like to do this? Lymphedema. I don't know if any of y'all have seen women wearing those sleeves. We live in Louisiana. They're hot. They're awful. They're tight. It's like wearing spanks on your arm all day long. It's no fun. The rate of lymphedema, I didn't put anything up here because you can find numbers all under the sun. Um, and a lot of that depends on how are you calling it lymphedema. I mean, for me, it has to be clinically significant. But if you go in and just do measurements, especially the water submersion measurements where you put their arm in water and see how much water is displaced, you find lymphedema in up to like 50% of women that have had a lymph node dissection. Clinically significant lymphedema is probably closer to 20, 30%. It's hard to get an exact number because it's a fairly subjective thing as well as clinically the difference in the subjective feeling versus the clinical measurement is, is real and so um, probably 20 or 30 percent that's one in three people that is going to be subjective with their rings aren't going to fit their watches aren't going to fit their arm is bigger than the other arm it's uncomfortable it's swollen it's increased risk of infection um, all of that is a lifelong problem for the patient and are we really helping them none of the studies have ever shown that more surgery is better with breast cancer. And so we don't feel like we're really helping the patient. So if I can avoid, avoid an axillary lymph node dissection, I absolutely am done with an axillary lymph node dissection. It does not, Z11 does not apply to mastectomy patients. Have we translated into a few uh, mastectomy patients? Yes, we have. Because before, radiation oncologists were only radiating patients who have had a mastectomy if they had three positive lymph nodes. Having three positive lymph nodes throws you out of the Z11 criteria. So, of course, mastectomy patients don't, don't apply because they aren't going to get radiation. Well, now, I mean, my patients, if they have a two millimeter deposit in one lymph node and they see a radiation oncologist, they're getting radiated now. They're being much more, much more liberal, much more broad with who, who, who is being radiated. So, 
what's the difference in me taking a bigger specimen of breast, a smaller specimen of breast if they meet all the other criteria? Probably nothing. Do I have a paper that I can prove it when someone says, what does the literature say on it? No, I don't. And so that's a, that's a long conversation between me, the patient, the radiation oncologist, if we're going to avoid a lymph node dissection and someone who textbook says should have it. Staging, typical staging, TNM staging, tumor size, number of nodes, metastasis. Um, it's a big chart. Chemotherapy. So typically you have surgery first, then you get two or three weeks, three or four weeks to recover from surgery. Then if you need chemotherapy, chemotherapy is next. Chemotherapy we used to give to anyone who had greater than a five millimeter tumor. That was a whole lot of people. What we have learned is we have a lot more targeted therapy and we have a lot more um, a lot more specific therapy for breast cancer and so not everyone needs the shotgun approach of the stuff that's gonna make them feel bad, gonna make their hair fall out, gonna put them at risk of other things later. And so women who have triple negative breast cancers aren't eligible for any of those targeted approaches. Women who have a locally advanced breast cancer, chemotherapy, absolutely health. And then we have tests. We have the Oncotype DX and the Mammoprint test that can give us a little more scientific answer on who should get breast cancer. I tend to do Oncotype DX, not as much Mammoprint. So I put up an example result for this. So Oncotype DX tests are done on women who have no negative or one no positive ER positive breast cancers. And so an ER positive breast cancer is going to be treated with endocrine therapies, tamoxifen, aromatase inhibitor, something to block that estrogen to systemically decrease the risk of their breast cancer coming back. And so what this test does is, is chemotherapy going to benefit them on top of them taking tamoxifen? And you get a score. You get a low risk, an intermediate risk, or a high risk. And this is showing a low risk score. The 10 year risk of recurrence without chemotherapy is 7% for this patient. Adding chemotherapy is not going to give this patient any benefit. So if I have a patient who has a, a breast cancer that is node negative or one node positive, that's ER positive, I send this test so that we can get a little bit more scientific answer to do you need chemotherapy. Surgery, wait three or four weeks. Chemotherapy if you need it. Chemotherapy is anywhere from three to six weeks. There's two protocols, one of them six treatments, one of them eight treatments. They give those treatments either every two weeks or every three weeks. And so it can be as short as six treatments every two weeks, eight treatments every three weeks. That's where the three to six months come in. And that's a little dependent on the medical oncologist and the patient. After that, you get another three to four week rest to recover from chemotherapy. And that's when we do the radiation, if they need radiation. Patients who have had partial, patients who have had a partial mastectomy all need radiation. Patients who have had a mastectomy with a positive lymph node need radiation. Um, and then the locally advanced need radiation as well. There's multiple different radiation protocols. I tell the, I tell the patient you can just expect a six and a half week um, radiation. It's Monday through Friday. It only takes about 10 or 15 minutes. The big side effects are sunburning of the skin and you feel tired. Anyone who has to drive to the hospital every day, Monday through Friday, feels tired. Um, and, and, but there's different protocols. There's a Canadian protocol that it's three weeks instead of six weeks. There's partial breast radiation where we put in a, y'all don't do that here, huh? The surgeons do it or do y'all do it? Y'all do the mammoth, like radiology does the mammoth? Surgery. Surgery does. So partial breast radi uh, radiation kind of looks like a foley to me. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a thing on a balloon. You put it into the partial mastectomy wound, you blow up the balloon, and they hook it up to a machine and the radiation just circulates through that balloon. So you're not radiating the whole breast, you're radiating partial breast. Very strict criteria. If you talk to three different radiation oncologists, they will all give you different criteria for that. So all of that, I let the radiation um, doctors discuss. Target therapy, three receptors we look at with breast cancer, estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, and HER2 receptor. Um, HER2 is a big one. We have Herceptin and then we also have Progetta. It's a brand new drug. It's been showing huge amount of prog uh, prognosis. From y'all's standpoint, what you need to know about that, anybody that has a two centimeter lesion or bigger, they absolutely benefit from neoadjuvant therapy with Progetta. So those numbers and those measurements are very important for the person planning, um, planning their further treatment. Um, the study that looked at it showed that women with Herceptin uh, with docetaxel got a 21% complete response, but when you added the Progetta, it doubled to 39%. That's huge. We haven't seen anything do that in a long time. Um, so that's very promising. Only for HER2 positive cancers. It's targeting the HER2 receptor. If you don't have the HER2 receptor, it doesn't work. ERPR positive. 
Y'all probably heard a lot about this. Estrogen progesterone receptors, it's hormones feeding the cancer. The majority of breast cancer are this. Um, and the targeted therapy, tamoxifen, is for premenopausal women because it blocks it in a certain part of the estrogen chain that uh, can overcome the ovaries. Aromatase inhibitors, the studies show they are 4% better. So if you can use an aromatase inhibitor, it's 4% better. Um, but it blocks it in a different part of the chain and can't overcome functioning ovaries. And so the, the trade names you hear for those are Femara, Aromadex, Aromacin, they're the, the common ones. Women take that for five years. Some studies now show that they should be taking tamoxifen for 10 years. Again, you're only getting about 4% increase there. So you really got to have to see how much of a decreased risk you want to, to go through that. Makes them all feel menopausal. Hot flashes, moodiness, vaginal dryness, none of them like taking it. Bony aches with the aromatase inhibitors as well can be fairly significant. And that started at the very, and that started at the very end. So surgery, chemotherapy, radiation, and then endocrine, endocrine therapy. Yeah. And then I see my patients every three months for the first two years. I do a clinical exam on them because I don't trust anybody else's exam because I was trained as a general surgeon. Um, we start mammograms about six months after radiation for those women who have had partial mastectomy. If I have done the total mastectomy, I do not image those people because I know good and well there's nothing left for y'all to look at. Um, if somebody else has done it and I've ultrasounded it and I see there's still a fairly good layer of breast tissue, that's a different story. Um, and then after they make it to three years, I switch them out to six months and then it's kind of, okay, when do you want to come back? Do you want to come back once a year? Do you want to just see your primary care physician? What do you want to come back? And that is my cancer talk that I have with all of my new cancer patients. <laughs> Questions? Sorry guys, I took a really long time. Thank you so much. Great, thank you.